Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring us sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash in. Hey there, Tulare Community Church. Welcome to church. My name is Ty and this is Becca, and we've got just a couple of quick announcements for you this morning. That's right. Before we get to that, we just want to extend a warm welcome to you, especially those of you who are tuning in for your first time. Here at TCC, we're all about being disciples and making disciples. We do that by embracing our name, Tulare Community Church. That means that we are a church who seeks to be in and about our local community. We know that we were purposely put here to serve and spread the good news of the gospel in our city in this specific time and place, and we do that wholeheartedly. We have all sorts of initiatives and ministries that help us work towards this goal, one of those being the start of our newest campus across town, East Campus. We began our Sunday morning service at our East Campus last week. We call it a soft start because while we're not yet promoting this service to the public, we are operating as we will when we launch so we can test run the components of the service and really get the details dialed in while we finish renovations on the building. We are going to officially launch that East Campus this Easter. And speaking of Easter, that's not the only exciting thing happening that day. You mean aside from the obvious where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? Yes, I mean, in addition to the most celebration worthy thing that has ever happened in history, at our main campus, we will be coming together on the front lawn for a single outdoor service at 10 a.m. That's right. So one service on the main campus and one at our East Campus this Easter Sunday. We'll bring you more details as we get closer. So for now, just mark your calendars if you'd like to join us in person that day. Also, be sure that you are receiving and reading our TCC weekly emails every Thursday to keep up with all of the latest going on at and through our church. We're so glad that you're a part of TCC and we want you to be involved through prayer and participation whenever possible. Well, we're going to turn it back over to the band on stage as we continue with worship. As we move into this time of worship together, I encourage you to take everything that happened this past week, everything going through your mind today, everything competing for your focus and attention, and lay it at the feet of Jesus in surrender. 
Jesus, our hearts are yours, and we seek your presence as we sing of the great things that you have done. Thank you so much for joining us online today. Take it away, team.
Hey TCC, my name is Shane, I'm one of the pastors here. Open up your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Luke. We're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture today in chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. We're in a sermon series that we're calling Luke for All Seasons, which we started right after Christmas, and it's going to carry us all the way till Easter. And right now, we have entered into a time period on the liturgical calendar before Easter that is known as Lent. This is the first Sunday during Lent. And so we're using the Gospel of Luke as a lens through which we approach these changing seasons, taking us from Christmas to Lent to Good Friday and ultimately to Easter morning. Luke for all seasons, that's the idea. So part of the tradition of Lent is that it's a preparation period for the believer, preparing our hearts for Easter, solemnly, reflectively, intentionally, spiritually journeying toward a cross and an empty tomb. So let's look now to Luke to help prepare us for that. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. 
One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You know, that's an expression that more often than not is spoken with a good deal of derision, right? It's usually directed towards someone being pompous or arrogant or rude. Someone cuts in line in front of you and, hey, who do you think you are? Or, or Gene Knight's song, Mr. Big Stuff, right? Who do you think you are, Mr. Big Stuff? Who do you think you are? It's usually a derisive rhetorical question that implies that you are acting arrogantly, pompously, that you have an overly inflated assessment of who you are, that you have a wrong assessment of your worth, that you have a wrong assessment of your status, that you have a wrong assessment of your importance, that you're full of yourself. And that's another pretty great expression, full of yourself. And in our day and age, it's hard not to be full of yourself. It's a self-esteem generation. We're told from preschool that we're wonderful and special and unique and good. It's a self-esteem generation. It's the selfie culture. Pictures of you, by you, for your validation. We live for likes and hearts and comments about our image. News is curated to you. Businesses serve at your pleasure. How do we not become self-absorbed and full of ourselves? I heard Joy Behar on The View, they were talking about the war in Ukraine, just horrible death and destruction, and much worse is probably on the horizon. And Joy said, I also worry about the rest of Europe. What's going to happen there? I've been planning a trip to Italy. I've always wanted to go, and I couldn't previously because of COVID, and now this. What's going to happen in Italy? A war breaks out, and the thought that comes to mind is, what about my vacation? Now, I saw a comic strip that I thought was funny. I, I tried to find it again, but I couldn't. It was this image of a funeral, and the casket is being laid to rest in the earth. And the minister there says, does anyone wish to say a few words? And then someone in the back of the crowd shouts out, I'm trans! And I just thought, yeah, that's about right. It's so easy to make everything about us. And the trans issue is a perfect example, right? That the pride, the hubris, the entire world must bend and acquiesce to your internal feelings about yourself. The entire world must accommodate your preferred pronouns. The entire world must align with your assessment of yourself because the world revolves around you and your preferences. But before we get judgmental about other people, Let's recognize that this is about us. Our passage today centers on this sinful woman in contrast with Simon a Pharisee. He's a good religious person, like we might think of ourselves. He follows the law. He tries to be obedient to God. And as far as Pharisees go in the Gospels, he comes off pretty well. He's open to Jesus. He invites Jesus into his home. That's not nothing. Good, religious, moral person. But when it comes to the question... Who do you think you are? The sinful woman gets it right. And the difference between a right assessment and a wrong assessment of yourself is whether or not you see Jesus for who he really is. And one of the biggest obstacles to seeing God rightly is our own pride. You see the response here from the crowd, verse 39. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Now, maybe they're just marveling. Maybe they don't know what to think. You know, I don't want to be uncharitable to the crowd here. But it seems to me more likely that the question here is in the same tone that we see earlier in Luke when Jesus forgives sins. Luke chapter 5. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, they're educated. They went to seminary. They're theologically sound. They know that God alone can forgive sins. And yet they don't see God when he's standing right in front of them. It's like what the Apostle Paul says in Corinthians. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. This sinful woman, this sinful woman, she probably can't articulate it. She probably doesn't have a full grasp on all the theological implications. But she sees Jesus rightly. And so she sees herself in light of him. Sees her sin as utterly sinful and sees her desperate need for forgiveness. And by the Spirit, because it can happen no other way, by the Holy Spirit, she turns in faith to Jesus, rightly believing that he's the answer to that. And we know that because Jesus says these words to her in verse 50. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see how pride keeps us from seeing God? Because it's hard to be full of the Spirit if you're full of yourself. And knowledge is good. We want to love God with our minds and deepen our understanding of God. That's partially why we come to church, enriching our theology to love God more. But even good things can get wrapped up in our pride. Our knowledge can puff us up. Even spiritual disciplines, which are meant for our good, which are meant for our edification, which are meant to teach us about God, can be a source of pride in us. You see how this can get twisted in Scripture. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. Verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. They're doing the right things, but somewhere along the line, they have taken their eyes off God and put it on themselves. So even things like prayer and fasting, which are expressions of faith and dependence and humility, become sources of pride. Do you know that God opposes the proud? Think about that. God opposes the proud. Here are these words from 1 Peter. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We don't often think of anxiety as connected to pride, probably because we see anxiety and worry as weakness, but pride we see as boldness or even strength. But that's really not the case. In fact, it's a commonly regarded phenomenon in psychology that narcissism and insecurity go hand in hand. Uh, here's a recent study from NYU. It summarizes it this way. Narcissism is driven by insecurity, and not an inflated sense of self finds a new study, which offers a more detailed understanding of this long-examined phenomenon and may also explain what motivates the self-focused nature of social media. See, anxiety is in the same sphere as pride because they both stem from the same source, from a wrong assessment of who you are. Jesus says this, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? See, we're worried and anxious because we're not looking to God. We're looking to ourselves, and the thing is, we're not in control. We're anxious and steeped in worry and feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. But wait a minute. Why would the weight of the world be on my shoulders? I mean, who do I think I am? What grandiose notion do I have about myself that I think the weight of the world falls to me? Now see, pride and insecurity, pride and anxiety, they, they all stem from the same source of too high a view of ourselves because our view of God is too obscured. That's why humility is liberating. That's why Peter tells us that when we humble ourselves, God will lift us up. You know, G.K. Chesterton once said that angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Humble yourself and God will lift you up. And we see that in our passage. The sinful woman comes in burdened by her sin. 
but she lays it all down at the feet of Jesus in humility and tears, and Jesus lifts her up in every way. She comes in with a reputation as a sinful woman. That's how she's known. But she leaves as a daughter of the Most High and a sister in Christ that churches throughout the ages and across the globe have marveled at, marveled at her example, at her love, at her exuberance, at her boldness, coming in uninvited to a place where she knew she would not be welcomed and lavishing Jesus with her perfume on his feet, no less. It would have been more customary to anoint his head. The wording here is kind of odd. Verse 38, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. There's a kind of clunkiness in, in, in a spatial way that Luke is describing. It's like because of the way that people are reclining and seated, she can't reach his head. But that's all right for her. His feet will suffice. His feet are good enough for what was probably nard, really expensive. And she pours it all out, all that she has to offer at his feet, overflowing in humility and gratitude and love. Don't you want to see Jesus the way she sees Jesus? God lifts up her reputation, doesn't he? And she comes in with a burden of sin and he takes it away in his forgiveness. Humble yourself and he will lift you up. And if we want that, we have to strip away our pride. And we do that by seeing God rightly. Because when we see God for who he is, we see ourselves for who we really are. You know, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. And one of the customs associated with Ash Wednesday is to apply a mark of the cross on the forehead in dust. And a common refrain as the dust is being applied is to say, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's kind of a morbid thought, isn't it? It's, it's making you think about your mortality. And more than that, it's a little belittling. It's a little dismissive of my life, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Now, the Bible puts it this way in Psalms, for he, that's God, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. Here today, gone tomorrow. That's how you're going to summarize a life. Our lives are full and filled with meaning and love and family and friends and good times and noodle salad, ashes to ashes. Isn't that belittling? No, it's humbling, but it's not belittling. Death is humbling. Our mortality is humbling. Recognize that we're created beings is humbling. Realizing that we're not God is humbling. That does humble us, but what belittles us it's when we try to be God, when we try to bolster ourselves and elevate ourselves in our own eyes. So we say, there is no God. That way, we're not subject to anyone. That way, we're answerable to no one. And we're our own gods. We think that elevates us. But all it does is diminish us. It reduces us to a product of chance and dumb luck. It means we're unintended and unloved in a meaningless universe where all of our choices don't actually matter and we still end up as dust in the end. That's what belittles us. Our pride belittles us. Our bolstering belittles us. Oh, you may seem small next to God, but it's apart from God that we become nothing. It's with God that you are designed and intended. It's only with God that your choices matter. It's only with Him that your life matters in the end. And it's with God that you're immeasurably loved. That's not belittling. Pride diminishes. Humility raises. We humble ourselves recognizing that God is God and we're not. Humble ourselves recognizing that God is creator and we are creation. That's the first step in eradicating our pride is to see our place in creation. When we rightly see God as creator and ourselves as creation, that strips us of all our conceits. You know, hear these words from Corinthians. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? 
What do you have that you did not receive? Now, we cultivate our gifts, certainly. We work on our crafts, but we are created beings. Our minds, our talent, our abilities, our looks, our wit, everything that we might take pride in, in ourselves, is only a gift from God. Why then should there be any boasting? No, rather, it should lead us to gratitude and spur us on to pour out everything we are and everything we have at the feet of Jesus. Pride keeps us away from God. Humility brings us closer. Pride distorts our view. Humility brings clarity. And pride leads to self-righteousness. But humility leads us to compassion and empathy. We see that in our passage, verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. We say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We remember that we are mortal. We have a problem. Death is a problem. And the Bible tells us that the cause of death is sin. Romans, for the wages of sin is death. And that's a problem because as it says in chapter 3 of Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We have all gone astray. And so we are all guilty and face death. A little sin or a lot of sin, we're all in the same boat. So why should there be any pride? This is an odd thing to be a source of pride. But so often it is, right? Simon here thinks nothing of it that Jesus dines with him. He sees no problem with Jesus being near to him, but near to this sinful woman. Well, many of us have grown up in the church. Many of us came to Christ at a young age, and we've been guided and instructed in the ways of Christ. And because of that, we, we've been spared many of the harmful effects of sin in the world. There is a practical benefit to living in accordance to God's word. There is. It can shield us and spare us from all kinds of destruction and harm. But that can also give us a false sense of our situation and a false sense of our need for a Savior. See, we can look righteous by comparing ourselves to other people. They're in that situation because of the choices that they made. I didn't make those choices. I mean, they're really lost. They're depraved. I sin, sure, but not like that. I mean, I, I know that men are men and women are women. They're, they're beyond the pale. I have sin, sure. You know, I, I drink too much. I, I eat a bit too much. But I'm not like these bums wandering our streets, you know, drugged out of their minds. Oh, well, sure, I need a savior. I just don't need him as much. If you're judging your righteousness against others, you might come out pretty well. But when we stand before God in judgment, the question is not going to be, how did you do compared to everyone else? The question is going to be, how did you compare to Jesus? And not a single one of us is going to have a good answer. Simon doesn't see his sinfulness. He doesn't see his desperation. He doesn't see his need for a savior. He doesn't see his need for forgiveness because he doesn't see Jesus. He doesn't see Jesus for who he really is. If we don't see God clearly, we won't see ourselves clearly. We won't see our desperation. We won't see the degree to which we've been forgiven. We'll feel like we've been forgiven little, and so we'll love little. Pride distorts. Humility clarifies. Pride leads to self-righteousness, but humility leads us to compassion and empathy. Salvation is a gift of God. We didn't finish that verse in Romans. Let's get back to that. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation is a gift of God. It's never earned. Pride looks at the sins of others and says, I'm better than. Humility looks at the sins of others and says, There but for the grace of God go I. Simon and the sinful woman are both in debt, are both in need of forgiveness. The difference is she sees Jesus for who he is. And so sees her sin and sees her desperation and sees her need and it spills forth in her love. 
Humility comes to us by seeing God, by seeing God as our creator, that everything that we are and everything we have is from him, and by seeing God as our savior. How can you be proud at the feet of Jesus? How can you sneer at other people's sins from the foot of the cross? And lastly, humility comes to us by seeing God in one another in his church. We share Christ with one another. We share our testimonies. We offer up our gifts and our time and our talents and our voices in service to God, reminding ourselves and each other about who God is. And we need that because we're prone to look to ourselves, to our own needs, to our own interests, to our clicks, to our likes and our preferences. And the more we look to ourselves, the more obscure God becomes. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He, he wrote this, When I first became a Christian about 14 years ago, I thought that I could do it all on my own by retiring to my rooms and reading theology, and I wouldn't go to the churches and gospel halls. I disliked very much their hymns, which I considered to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually my conceit just began peeling off. I realized that the hymns, which were sixth-rate music, were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots in the opposite pew, and then you realize you aren't fit to clean those boots. His conceit is peeled away. He saw God better, and it leads to humility and a greater and deeper love. And isn't that what we find when we look at this sinful woman here? Don't we know God better because of her? She shows us profoundly who Jesus is because she was forgiven much and so loved much. Let's praise this God. Friends, there is no place for pride at the feet of Jesus. I hear these words from Ephesians as our benediction. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Go in peace.